Hello there. I am Jacqueline Hanna with Food Co-op. I'm the Food Co-op Development Specialist with the Food Co-op Initiative. Welcome to today's webinar, Branding Time Speak. Some topics we present are just too big for one session, so we've actually offered a series of three webinars on this topic, one for each of the three stages of startup food co-op development. Today is our third and final Branding Times 3 session, focused on the role of branding in stage three startup development. Food Co-op Initiative is a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing support and resources to people organizing new food co-ops all, all the way across the U.S. We've helped 79 new co-ops open their stores and are working with 140 more new communities that are working to organize their own food co-ops. Food Co-op Initiative exists to support startup food co-ops at all stages of development. If you're just getting started, please give us a call and introduce yourself and learn more about our resources. You can find contact information or sign up for our mailing list on our website, www.foodcoopinitiative.coop.coop. Our support and resources are free. Our work is supported by grants from the USDA, National Cooperative Bank, National Cooperative Grocers, the Cooperative Foundation, and the Cooperative Fund of New England. We're also supported by no donations from mature food co-ops and their members. We'd like to thank all of our sponsors that make this work supporting you, the future co-ops of our country, possible. Before we get started, a little housekeeping and a few tech tips. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available soon on the Food Co-op Initiative website as well as on our YouTube channel. We have an extensive library of previous webinars on topics ranging from how to organize your first community meeting to hiring a GM. We encourage you to share this webinar with your fellow co-op organizers who are not able to attend today. The webinar is meant to serve you and is, meets your needs best if you interact with us. So please send in your questions during the webinar. You can post them on, your YouTube, on the YouTube page if you are actually logged into YouTube. You can also send them to info at fci.coop.coop anytime during the webinar. Mary Stenz Wilborn, our Outreach and Operations Coordinator. You can see her down in the corner of your screen there. Hi, Mary. <laughs> um, she will actually be collecting your questions and sharing them with me throughout the webinar. And we will do our best to get to all of your questions. Some we will interject within uh, our, our dialogue and conversation, and a lot of them we'll take at the end. All right, let's get started. Our guest expert today is Nicole Klimek of CDS Consulting Co-op. Nicole is a store planning and marketing consultant who has worked with dozens and dozens of co-ops on their store layouts, fixture plans, and branding. We're very excited to have her here with us today. Welcome, Nicole. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Can you get us started with an overview of what we're going to work on today? Sure. This is the last of the stages for your brand development. Um, you already know who you are, you have your mission statement, and it is now time to open the door. So we are going to kind of walk through the things that you're going to need to do in order to make your um, transition from not having a storefront to opening a storefront successful. Very exciting stage. Excellent. All right, so you're down with stage two. Um, the community knows who you are, you are visible, you have your identity, everything is very, very clear. And now you're at that critical point where your doors are going to open and you have to make sure that what everyone knows you to be right now and what they are going to know you to be when you open your doors are the same thing. So you now need to translate that into actual space, actual visual, physical things that um, are really going to just cement your presence in the community. All right, so let's talk about how we do that. Awesome. All right, so first of all, I gotta be like the bearer of bad news. Um, every time I go into a project, I get to be the person that's hated for like 15 minutes because I come in and I ask all these questions. Um, you know, what do you want to see in your produce department? And what are you thinking about your general lighting or any questions that you might not have thought about? And you know what, honestly, you've been told that that is your general manager's job. And if you had a general manager right now, it would be the general manager's job. But most startup co-ops don't have general managers when we would recommend that they have them about a year or so before you open. They're usually there maybe six months if you're lucky, um, probably four is the average that I see. 
And so you need to have all of your schedules and timelines, you need to have all of your architectural documents, and you need to have all of your equipment specified before your general manager comes on board, or you'll never even secure financing. So well, and I want to make clear, too, that we do recommend as a startup, and you are aiming to have your general manager there a, the year before opening. But quite often, this is a struggle financially or finding the right candidate as the project moves forward takes longer than you think. So Nicole deals with the reality, which is she actually ends up working with you, the board, quite often on these major design decisions before your GM gets there. But that said, we still recommend that you try and hire your general manager a year before you actually open your store. Yes, and even then, a lot of the decisions that need to be made are still going to be made ahead of time. You still have to give your store planner a direction. I need to know where to go. Um, I need to have questions answered about your community and about your demographics. And they're questions that I need you to answer because if I answer them, they're just not going to be as sincere and they're not going to be as accurate. So it's not that I'm going to come in and just hand you a floor plan and be like, here's your store of your dreams. We're good to go. It's going to be walking through a lot of what's in your head. Um, you may not think you have an opinion, you may not think that there's something in there that you want to see, but believe me, when we walk through the process, there will be. I'm going to pull stuff out of your brain that you didn't even know was there. Um, sometimes it can be a little bit frustrating, but I promise you, no one's ever quit. <laughs> no one's ever not opened their co-op because they're frustrated, and we always get through to the next stage. And you're not going to make a wrong decision because I am going to tell you what I think, and I am going to walk it through it with you, but you will understand what's going on because you'll be able to then translate to the general manager and to the rest of the co-op when you open why we did what we did. And we can go to the next one. <laughs> so there are actually seven stages in the design process, but the three that we're going to deal with are um, schematic design, and that we're not even going to get too much into like which stage of um, the four and three that it falls into or the cornerstones or anything. But we're just going to go one, two, three. Schematic, preliminary, and final. Schematic is you know late stage one, sometimes early stage two, just depending on where you're at. And a lot of it depends on if you have your site, if you have multiple sites, if you need some sort of um, financing. Um, oftentimes you have to have a fixture plan before you even go into those meetings. So you may not even have a lease yet. Um, I come in at all different points. That's just conceptual design. That's basically, it looks like marker drawings. It's to scale, but there's no manufacturers. You can see like the green is the produce department and brown is bulk and it gives you a really good idea of what the layout could be, but it is not it's not architectural yet and it's not structural yet. So that stage usually takes about, I'm going to go with startups, six weeks maybe. There's a lot of decisions at this point that you have to make and also a lot of opinions that you don't know that you have. Um, they come out, you know, you may want, you may imagine like you want service meat or whatever it is. You don't, you don't know that yet, but you know, when, when we walk through this process, um, it comes out. And so then we have to talk about the, um, what's it going to do for the rest of the store and actually go through the fixture plan and layout and understand why we're doing what we're doing. I base a lot of my numbers off of um, sales and data projections and all of that. So we really have to make sure the sizing is correct. And then to bring your brand into that, we have to make sure that if you have um, an open marketplace or a farmer's market type field store, that you have an uh, open produce department, you have a certain amount of aisle space. You, if you're really like urban store and you, you can have like four foot aisles, we have to figure that out. And we have to make sure that we're able to do that right away, otherwise we're not going to leave room for it for the next phase, which is preliminary design. Um, late stage two, early stage three, uh, it's the longest design phase. It's where we get into equipment, and it's where we get into equipment lists, and architects, and general contractors, and refrigeration, and all that junk that you're probably not going to have to think too much about, but um, going to have to be in the background and giving me a little bit of guidance. Um, this is probably the stage where you're going to hire your general manager towards the end of it, because this will be about 18 months to um, a year before you open the store. Um, branding is really important here. Uh, can we go back to the last? Well, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, we can go to the next one. Sorry, Joel. Okay, so that's what a schematic drawing looks like, and we can well, kind of walk through it a little bit more. 
Can um, I pause Jacqueline, for just you see, a second? You, you, talked, you touched on this, and I just want to touch on it again, that if you haven't watched the first two webinars um, that Nicole did for us on branding, you feel like, well, wait a minute, we're, we're drawing store designs, and then we're talking about branding. Remember, branding from early on is about how you want your store to feel, what your community expects from it. All along, the work you're doing is to build a store. So it, as, as Nicole pointed out, you, know, you may be asked as early as late stage one or early stage two if you need a, a schematic drawing to see if leasing a space makes sense for your group to be thinking about, do we want it to feel really wide and spacious and like it's an outdoor farmer's market, or is it really important we have an extensive cafe because this is going to be a big meeting space. That's part of your brand, what you're going to deliver to the community. So I just want to kind of bring that concept back as we walk through what it's actually like to design a store. Couldn't have said it better myself, Jacqueline. Um, so this is what a schematic plan looks like. And at this point, we've already walked through what your brand is. Um, we've already decided some brand standards. Um, all of that's going on like right at the beginning at the same time. It's a really critical, stressful, but really, really fun and energetic point in the entire process of opening up your co-op because now things are starting to get really, really visual. It's not just the branding piece of it. It's not just your websites. It's not flyers and all that. Now it's actually bringing it into open space. So when we take a look at this, we start talking about how we want customers to flow in. Um, you know, like we talked about the open marketplace, um, where the fixtures should be, the heights of them, all of that starts coming into play based on who you are. You know, are you a community-based hub for mothers, or are you a college town and need to have a lot of frozen foods? All of that kind of stuff comes into it, and all I have to do from, um, or all you have to do is uh, explain to me what you want to see, and I'm going to take it from there. I'm not going to ask you how many doors of frozen do you want in your store. I already know that. But I am going to ask you if bulk is a big thing for you, and we're going to walk through a lot of that process, even if you don't want to, just so that you can kind of understand, and I can make sure that the plan looks the way that you want it before we move on to the next stage. Well, and I want to make sure I reassure everyone that it's actually a really fun and delightful process. You can ask anyone who's done it with Nicole. It's actually a great deal of fun to talk about what you want your store to feel like and what's going to be in it. She will not be annoying you. You'll be having fun. No. And there's pictures <laughs> and samples. You know, and anyone loves to get, like, feel some granite and whip out some paint samples. It's fun. Um, so a lot of the questions that I get are, how do we do it? You know, this is a 2D drawing. That you can't visualize these things. I can barely do it, and I do it as a job. We have to think about it on a different scale and a different level. So the example that I have here is Garden City Food Co-op. They're a startup in Toronto um, that I am working with. Well, St. Catharines, but the Toronto area. And their brand is huge. It's a big college town. They work really, really hard on how they're going to look, how they're going to feel, and that their neighborhood's at like kind of a transitional period and has been for a while that they're being revitalized. So knowing all of this about them, the abundance of local producers, that they're a college town, they have a big lunch crowd, they're right off the L station, um, there's a parking garage on both sides of them, and there's a lot of local restaurants. So the first thing that we do is walk through it, and I want to see the competition. I want to see what other restaurants are doing. I want to see the kind of people that are going in and out. And I really want to assess the neighborhood that the co-op is going into so I can figure out um, how that brand identity needs to be focused into the fixture plan. And on this one, you can see that produce department does not have a lot of fixtures in it, but it's huge. They have um, farmer's markets all the time, and the farmers want to be able to come in and roll up um, some of their bins and use a lot of that space. So being a smaller store, we have to make sure that we have that space to accommodate for it. So that's being thought of right now. The lunch crowd, all of that yellowish kind of mustard color is all their deli. It's a huge lunch crowd, so they're able to walk right in, grab their stuff, and go at the register without having to go through the rest of the store. That yeah, part of size the of the store, this is really large. And just for those playing at home, the green is, is produce. So is that people walking straight into the produce department, right? Yep, that arrow going in mm -hmm. goes right through there. Excellent. Yep, and you can loop around the other side, go through the registers, and go through to the deli if you want. Um, we don't try to do that with every store. Uh, you, you want people to hit the back of your store and go get their milk, but you have an area that lunch is huge, and those people only have 20 minutes. They're only going to go to your store if they can get in and get out. So we're offering so, that because it's a draw. 
so their brand is really focused on fresh, and that's what we're seeing reflected here. So like if you were saying, well, we want the we want lots of prepared food and a big fresh feeling. That's what this store. That's the brand. That's yes. how you want your store to feel, and this is how Nicole is executing your store to reflect that brand. Right. And if you don't know your brand, you know what? I've seen it many, many times. You go into a store, and you've probably experienced it too. Where you're like, this store doesn't feel, you know, quite right. It feels kind of funky. That's because they didn't have all those elements in the very beginning. It's easy to do if you have it all put together, and it flows together really, really well. But you have to do the footwork first. So. Next slide, please. Preliminary design. This is like the longest and the most frustrating stage for everybody. Um, this is when like your architects are involved and general contractors and uh, interior designer. Uh, sometimes I do it on stores. Sometimes we work with somebody else. It's colors and all that stuff's being thrown at you in about eight to twelve month period is, is the average for like a five to ten thousand square foot store. Mm -hmm. um, the plans look more like this, and we start putting in actual fixtures. And this is where we kind of look at the brand a little bit deeper and start talking about um, we call it FF &E, which is like uh, your fixtures, your finishes, your equipment, and all that stuff, all the visual pieces of it. And we figure out what wood types, um, shelving heights, uh, types of shelving, and we start specifying it down to the detail. It's a very, very inexpensive way to brand yourself because you need all of this equipment anyways. So if mm -hmm. you're going for a really fun, funky feel, you might as well throw in some shelves that are curved or some metal somewhere that you have to add in anyways, you know, but the standard that you would add in would be maybe like plywood instead of metal. So going through all of those pieces, knowing your brand is really, really going to save you a lot of money because your brand's already been built into the equipment. Like, that's going to be you. And then you come in with the finishing touches with the interior design later. Next slide. All right, so how to bring it in during the preliminary design. It's kind of the same way, but we do deal a lot more with actual physical things. So like your lane lights and your aisle lights, some of your marketing piece comes in. And most of you are not going to have marketing managers. I, I don't think I've ever worked with a co-op that has had um, a marketing manager on board right away. So this is something that you work with your interior designer, you work with your store planner um, to kind of execute ahead of time, making sure that it sticks with your brand standards. Um, so you know, something simple, something that is versatile but still screams you. I mean, if you look at the front of Seward Co-op, you drive up and down Franklin, you know that that's Seward Co-op. There's no way you're going to miss it. And that's how you feel when you walk in. It's not overwhelming. It's just who they are. Um, you know, common ground. You walk in there and you just know you're there. And a lot of those decisions were actually based on just equipment pieces. So just making sure that you have all of those standards and communicating them to the entire team, um, whether it be the general contractor or the interior designer or your outreach coordinator or whoever it's going to be, making sure that they understand it and convey that as well, um, it's going to come through in your plan and it's going to make it look really, really nice. Excellent. And this, again, remember, is something Nicole's going to walk you through. She doesn't expect you to know what some of the, the really inexpensive choices are that are going to ex execute and really express your brand. She's going to show you options and choices and walk you through them and make it really easy for you. Yeah, I'm going to show you pictures and say, do you like this? Is <laughs> basically how it works. We're not going to go through too many vendors unless you really, really want to. Um, it's going to be, you know you need shelving. Which one do you like? Let's pick some colors and that kind of stuff. Um, leave the technical things to me. But having your knowledge of the co-op is really, really, really critical in that point. So final design is about six months before you open the door. Um, you should have your general manager by now. I've worked with stores that have not at that point. I'm still kind of the mini project manager working with the, um, the board, but working on getting that general manager in. This is when you start working on the merchandising plan a little bit deeper, figuring out where things are going to go on the shelves. Um, the things that you are not going to have to worry about, but you should know that they're coming. You know, you need to you need to think about what the store is going to look like when it is open and what the shelves are going to look like when they're stocked. So this is mm -hmm. when you can bring in a lot more of the details. 
Um, you can bring in a lot of your graphics and a lot of your really exciting marketing stuff. You can execute that final marketing plan, um, getting in local press, um, trying to get people in and really, really excited. The space is there. Um, it's being put together. So have events, have people walk through when it's safe, um, have videos, all of that kind of stuff, and get ready for that soft opening. And then when you have that, it's just going to blow people's mind and they're already going to feel like they're at home. It's the shortest phase, but it sometimes is pretty, pretty critical. It is, it is a very, very exciting phase and it's a very important phase to have your branding down really well. And we're talking about branding in the store. We're also going to talk about how to communicate your branding in other ways as we move forward. But one of the ones I think is most interesting um, is a general manager who has done build out projects that I didn't know until last minute that that's a whole separate thing from your store layout design and it needs to be done well and who do you turn to and it turns out this is something Nicole does as well so I'd love Nicole talk about the difference and how she walks you through this process so you're not alone. Um, and you cut out just a little bit what was the first part of that Jacqueline? Oh okay um, I said that my experience as a general manager is that um, I didn't realize interior design is a separate thing yes. from store layout design and I think a lot of people don't as an experienced general manager I didn't see that coming and that blindsided me at the last minute you need to do the interior design of the store not just the layout so this is something you really execute a lot of brand and Nicole's gonna be the one who helps you through that it's I didn't know who was gonna help me through it so this is great yeah it's so ignored I come in projects and I'm like so what's your interior design budget what do you mean into your design budget? I'm like lighting, flooring, colors, graphics, art, any of those details, and people are like I don't have that in my budget. That's you know somewhere in the back, and it's it, that's what people see. People feel your fixtures and they feel a lot of the equipment. They feel the layout because they're shopping it. But your interior design and in part your marketing, but that's the visual piece of it this is the ambiance you know it's like this a good store plan is the bone is the structure of your co-op and the interior design is basically like the frosting on the cake you need to have it look good and you need to have it functional this is another thing where the choices are completely endless you can do anything but knowing the prices knowing um, sourcing um, figuring out if it's going to be green if it's not going to be green and just knowing all of that stuff is incredibly difficult even for people who do it all the time because materials are constantly changing it's very different than store planning where our equipment doesn't really change it's been the same manufacturers for eons but interior design people are coming up with new products all the time and oftentimes they're not tested um, Oftentimes that they're not made for commercial use or whatever. So knowing all of that and knowing where to get them, whether it's local or it's somewhere else, is really, really important um, and can really only be done by a professional. There's not a book that you can grab to do it. You can't just go pick out a color swatch and call it a day. It's something that you really do have to think about. Um, it is well, one of those things that I work great. with other people on. Oh, what was that? You brought, up something, you brought up something really great. Um, I think startups, you, and something that I think actually generate questions, though, is you said there's no budget you know, for interior design, and startups don't panic. Um, what I want to point out here is if your pro forma doesn't have a separate line for interior design elements, depending who you work with, your pro forma might or might not. Um, that budget comes out of your build-out and equipment budget. When you get closer to actually doing this work, you'll want to talk early on with Nicole about how to set up an interior design budget and set that money aside. Your pro forma is the really broad picture of how you're going to spend your money, and then there's the more detailed picture. Um, so if you don't have that line on your pro forma and you're going, oh, where's my interior design budget? Don't worry. Um, that can be pulled out and separated. Just make sure you talk to Nicole early in the process about uh, what might be realistic for that budget. Perfect point, yes. Um, interior design can be up to $100 a square foot sometimes. And yeah, it's already built in there because obviously co-ops wouldn't start um, if they had to come up with that extra money. Um, but it, Jacqueline, you're right. It is really important to make sure that you set it aside so that you have all that resource and all that cash ready and you know where it's going and it's not just going to be like slowly pulled away. Cause but, um, but you don't need to find another $50,000. It's already in your budget. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't have to come up with anything extra. But um, it this is the first thing that gets pulled. It's always those LED lights that go. So yeah. walking through that whole process and understanding it and having at least some of your budget set aside for it is really important. Great point. Cool. We can go to the next one. Awesome. So we're co-ops. We're huge on local. We're huge on um, 
anything that can come from our community. So I wanted to talk about how to source things locally, um, some good ideas, some not so good ideas, and uh, ways that we can kind of fix that into the store planning part of it, but also into the interior design piece of it. These are all examples Great. of some local artists. Um, I got common ground there. I love that the chairs were donated by the community. I know that it can cause some problems because they're different heights. So sometimes, like working with your interior designer um, on these really great ideas, they can just kind of fine tune those things and kind of figure out little nuances that might happen, um, or ways to kind of come up with them when they do happen, mm -hmm. or come up with solutions. Um, these are all really awesome things. Like Cook County, they uh, did a new location and they took part of their mural with them off the wall. It was incredibly important for the community, and now it hangs over their um, walk-in dairy cooler. Sometimes you want to have a local artist do some murals. It's hard. It's hard when you're moving, um, and it's hard when you're starting because people are going to have a very big attachment to the art that they do. So I always say to people that they need to have um, maybe more than one person come in and do a piece. So if you're doing a mural, maybe it's one main artist and have a couple other people come in so there's not as much focus on just one person. And if you have to cover it up or it gets ruined or... I don't know, lightning strikes it and it falls down. You don't know. Um, it, there's not as much animosity towards the co-op for that piece of art like disappearing from the community. Um, it's a really good point I'm going to make quick. If you're going to do murals, put it on a surface that um, you actually can put it on a surface that's attached to the wall and is movable. Um, your future general manager will bless you for this. Uh, people will get really attached to the murals if you do them. Of course, they really uh, become really tied to the sense of local in your co-op. But if they have to move a wall, they have to change a wall, you have to move the co-op eventually, um, there can be a lot of a bad feeling um, if, the, if the mural can't be saved. So you really talk with Nicole about if you're going to do that, there's probably ways to do it to make it on a surface that's actually movable. Good point. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> signage, too. Like, if you have it's an extra... I love it when people, because, you know, you're all going to have your second locations, or you're going to relocate and expand because your co-op's in Iraq, but bringing, like, your old sign with you and putting it in the vestibule. St. Peter did that in Minnesota. Um, it looks so cool, and it keeps that history and tells that story that we really, really try to tell, and it, for free. You're basically doing it for free when you're bringing it with you. So those kinds of things you can work with your interior designer, and you can brainstorm, and whether it's me or somebody else, it's one area where there are other good interior designers for co-ops, you can do it well. You're not going to understand co-ops necessarily, but I work with other interior designers quite often, and they're very good at what they do. So working with them and then maybe working with the store planner, working with to make sure that it has that local flair and has that local um, community feeling to it. And that's part of your brand. Great. Cool. All right, so a little bit of the fundamental piece of it. What exactly does interior design include? And some of these kind of overlap a little bit. You'll notice that like signage and graphics uh, could be considered marketing. And in some respects, they are. Usually on projects like this, the store planner, the interior designer, whoever's doing the marketing, whether it's someone on the board that's a volunteer, whether it's the store planner or interior designer, whatever it is, um, could be an outside consultant. They're all coming together and they need to make sure that their medium, whether it's store planning or you know interior design, is all put together in the same way. So it needs to be cohesive. You need to have all of the colors have the right color uh, properties. You need to have um, the right curves in the right places. Like All of those standards need to be covered by everybody, otherwise it looks really hodgepodgey. You know, it's like, don't go spray paint a sign in your backyard and put it up there and then two days later your general manager is like, that's not our color. Well, that's the closest spray paint they had. You know, stuff like that does happen, and it sounds mm -hmm. kind of funny when I say it, but um, it's not something that you would often think of. You know, it's mm -hmm. not something that's on the top of your mind because it's not your job. Just like running a board is not on the top of my mind because it's not my job. So there are going to be things that you're going to miss. Um, lighting is huge. Lighting is very, very huge. It's very expensive, but it can make or break a lot of your products. Um, meat especially, yeah. or produce. If you get the wrong color lamp, which is a bulb for everybody else, um, they're technically lamps, if you get the wrong color, your meat could look blue. 
or your produce could look uh, spoiled. So having someone know that, and it's an actual science, like you need to have some engineering behind it and you need to have, uh, every manufacturer is different and there's different specifications and there's a lot of people touching just that one little piece. It's not something that your architect can just go do unless they've done multiple co-ops. You need to have someone that's really good at lighting do it, otherwise you're gonna have those really odd, dark, or too bright spaces. Um, yeah, and I've actually lived through cutting the budget when it came to lighting. Uh, that's a really common place to cut the budget, uh, by the way. And uh, we've done that at a store that I was running. And we ended up going back and putting it all in later, <laughs> which can be done. But if at all possible, um, you want to leave enough room in there for lighting because it makes a huge difference in effectively selling groceries. It's really actually not the place to cut the budget if possible. No, but there's been studies that show, and they're different numbers based on different manufacturers, but you can have anywhere from like 8 to 27% increase in sales just by decent lighting. That's huge. If you open up with decent lighting, yep. it's just amazing. Um, flooring is kind of a nice thing. Everyone loves flooring. Um, I have a little theory that I throw out to people, or a little... Uh, little saying uh, people really shouldn't be looking at your lighting and they shouldn't be looking at your floor and they should be looking at your product. So what you want to do is make sure that that floor is easy to move around. It's not too flashy. Like don't put the mural on the floor because then people will be like walking through your store looking down at the ground. You want them to buy your stuff. You want to pay your rent. So make sure that it's um, operationally efficient. It's easy to clean. It's attractive. Like it can't be an ugly floor. It's you know something that you want to maintain pretty well and you know last you a long time but it's also something that unless you know the different surface materials um, it's really hard to get in there and do the appropriate flooring. Stained concrete is so popular right now I hate stained concrete. Um, if the stain comes off it shows wear patterns immediately. Um, epoxy, I love epoxy, that's great. Uh, laminate, can't do that with refrigeration. People will tell me uh, we have wood floors, we're gonna refinish the wood floors. I'm like no you're not, that's a horrible idea with two tons of refrigeration on top of it. Just things that you wouldn't normally think about, um, that would be your interior designer and you know, your store planner and architect working on that. So it's huge mm -hmm. and it brings in your brand. If you're going to be a shoddy co-op that has holes in the floor and it's bowing in the middle of it, that can happen and I've seen it happen a lot. So pay attention. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about the, the signage and the graphics and all that. That can be interior design or marketing or all together. Um, but seriously, the most important thing about the fundamentals is that they all make sense and that they all come together in a cohesive way. Let's talk a little bit about one of the fundamentals you brought up here is messaging. Um, as we're talking about brand, that's what we're here to talk about today, we're talking about executing that brand as you go into store design, uh, as you're working with Nicole, but also, you know, startups are known actually for generally being some of the best at social media and communicating um, with their owners because you don't have a store to communicate in. Um, but it's really important that your message is starting to transition during stage three. It's changing. Suddenly you're building out this store. Um, suddenly you're about, you're really talking to people about the grocery store and being a grocery store, not just the message of trying to get new owners, although you're still working on that. So it's time to maybe rethink and recalibrate your social media a little. And Nicole has brought in a couple surprise guests for us to talk about that. Nicole, you want to yeah. introduce us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Holly and Michael, they are new consultants at CS Consulting Co-op, and they work especially with social media. So <laughs> amazing value and asset to our co-op, and I'm going to let them take it from here. Great. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Nicole. Um, yeah. Thank you guys for having us today. Um, so I just wanted to talk really briefly about um, the stage of your social media accounts at, and kind of making sure that um, you're at where you need to be with social media as you are figuring out where you need to be with your store design. Because similar to your um, store and branding all throughout, um, think about your website and your social media channels as a, basically a digital version of your store. And you want to make sure that your identity is clearly represented there too. And again, just like you would invite your um, customers into your members into your store once you open your doors, you also want to invite your members members to join you on social media uh, as soon as you have that um, open and, and ready for them. And um, so we're hoping that 
at this point you have a social media strategy, you have your account set up, and you've been um, communicating with uh, your your um, members and your potential members through these channels already, um, the, the best way to keep them coming back and to start building a, a long-term connection with them is to provide them value, much like you would inside the store. Provide them value at the social media channels. So there's a couple ways that, that you can do that through social media. You want to start by building relationships with your community members. Uh, you can provide exclusive discounts to those that choose to join you on social media channels, as well as uh, platform-specific giveaways and freebies. So I'm going to go into the building relationship part. Thank you, Holly. Um, this really requires one basic thing, and it's just about being real. That is all social media is. It's a, it's a beautiful extension and a real person extension of your marketing efforts that you have up there. So the tone of voice that you're using in your posts uh, should really reflect your target customer. Um, you might want to go back one slide. I don't think we're quite at the end. Yeah, there we go. Um, but uh, when member owners ask questions of you, you know, you're at that point, like Holly was just saying, you, got, you have your strategy, hopefully. And when member owners ask questions of you, you got to respond. And what's interesting here, a study by American Express found that people on social media, members on social media, they just want a response from a brand that they trust. They don't even care if you're right. They just want a response as quickly as you can. And uh, instead of waiting a few days to kind of comprehend, you know, they just want a real-time interaction with your co-op. And that, that is what is a lot of fun that we get to play with and, and see some real success in social media strategies. So if someone does ask you a question, uh, just respond in that timely manner, even if you just say something like, uh, hey, great question. Give us a bit of time. We'll get you an answer uh, as soon as we have one. And that kind of real person interaction, that is what builds your relationship and your credibility for your co-op incredibly fast. One of the principal rules of branding is know your audience. And again, much like your store design and the co-op that knew that they had a lunch crowd that wanted to come in and get some quick, fresh food, um, you know your community members best and you should know what they are looking for from you. So when you have a Facebook account and you have other social media accounts, use those tools in the best way that those tools can be used for, for the specific platform, but be sure that you give them what they want. So when you think about Facebook, um, they're probably coming back to your Facebook page regularly, not just to see pictures of a community event that you might be at. Um, sure, that that plays into it, but they're looking for something that um, makes their lives better or easier or improves their lives in some way. So this could be recipe information and uh, it could be lifestyle improvement information. It could be articles that you've written or that you've sourced. A lot of times they're looking for special discounts or promotions that um, maybe it's available in your store or in your newsletter, but um, to to put it on Facebook, you're going to be able to reach a, a larger audience that's looking for something special, that extra, um, that extra push for why they, they should maybe become a part of your, uh, your co-op. So to go a bit further into that, into giveaways and freebies, this is something, it sounds a little cheesy, but it really works when it comes to that whole ball of building relationships. Uh, giveaways and free stuff are just magnets for grocery stores and, and co-ops. I mean, people love free stuff. I love free stuff. So as with your discounts, using your social media profiles, but maybe in a different way with the smaller audience, like maybe on your Instagram uh, accounts or even your Twitter, uh, and supply instant giveaway deals. You know, say the 15th person to uh, retweet a post or the 10th person to send in a picture of their dog will get free dog grooming kits, you know, uh, hashtag co-op dog, you know, something like that. I don't, I don't know, just made that up. But that example on the slide that you see uh, with the arrow going down, that is something Whole Foods does every year. I just wanted to point this out to this audience. They have figured out that they have a very engaged Twitter audience this very specific week in December. So they show all the love all the discounts and all the giveaways to their Twitter audience one week every year on Twitter. 
and it works very well like that. And now marketing like this is really, it's only different from the traditional ways in that it's in real time. That's, that's really the biggest difference of social media and how we shop and connect with the brands uh, that we trust. So, ding, next slide. Real quick, um, yeah. as we're talking about transitioning into stage three, I just want to point out that this is kind of what we're talking about. You hear this transition in language in your social media um, and what Holly and Michael are saying to not just communicating to your owners about this potential project, but maybe even starting to behave a little bit more like a grocery store during this phase before you're actually even open. You can, as you're bringing in um, products and stuff, and your general manager will probably be in charge of this, um, but you can, if you uh, still have someone doing your marketing who's on your, you know, um, your uh, volunteer team, which is often the case until the store gets open, you can, as you're bringing in products you're considering, actually do giveaways of these products saying, this is what's going to be on our shelves. So don't think of this as, well, this has nothing to do with us. This is after we're open. If you're still going to have volunteers working on your marketing, this is part of that social media, tra media transition into yep. talking like a grocery store. Totally agree. Thank you for that, Jackie. Um, mm -hmm. Now, looking at providing more value as you are in this uh, uh, phase of the co-op here, um, we do a lot of focusing on content and engagement. So there are a few ways of thinking when it comes to providing value to your members and potential members as you're going through this uh, phase. And uh, one that I wanted to point out is your content creation. So some of the most effective ways of providing value comes from sharing original and third-party content. I'll explain that in a second from uh, trustworthy news sources. So original content would be a blog post, a video, something like that. Very simple. That's original content. Third-party content comes from uh, legitimate sources like you know USA Today or the Washington Post, you know news sources or other blogs and and other co-ops or even CBS, CC. You know, share their stuff. Why not? Um, that is third-party content. And once you get into a rhythm of both original and third-party content of supplying your feeds with a steady stream, that provides value. It provides trust. It provides brand awareness for this phase that you're going through. I want to point out one thing. What you're seeing a screenshot of is a tool I love to use, and I believe Holly uses it as well. It's called Flipboard. What you can do and it's very easy, especially for volunteer marketers, you know, if you're really tight on time. All you have to do is you plug in the topics that you're interested in, and Flipboard creates a whole magazine of real-time content for you to share. It's free, by the way. We only do free stuff, mainly. But you can see organic food, philosophy, entrepreneurship, and I get all the latest stories in those little magazines, and I can share those out uh, with the world, and it, it works fantastic. And it's not about just providing content. Real quick, I'm going to do a quick, I'm sorry, I'm going to break in and do sure. a quick reminder. If you have questions, please do send them to info at fci.coop. We'll be going into our question section next, and I'm going to hand it back to Holly. Thank you. Yes, please ask us any questions you have. We love answering questions about social media. So um, as, as I was saying earlier, that this is social media is your opportunity to provide additional value to your members and potential members. And what you get in return when you provide that value is connection. So you're seeking connection with um, the people that choose to con to, to reach out to you, either coming into your store or connecting with you on social media. And the way, the formula to get that connection to really solidify is content plus engagement. And that's what equals connection. So um, the other rule of, of kind of marketing that I, that I like to keep in mind is to meet your, meet your audience where they are. So if, if you're, if you're on Facebook, if you're on Twitter, if you're on Instagram, or if you're on Pinterest, keep in mind that there's different demographics that are already there at each platform. And they already have certain ways that they expect brands to interact with them in those platforms. So the more that you can understand how people in general, the trends of each of those platforms are used today, the better you can meet them where they are, find the audience that you want to find where they are, and talk to them the way they want to be talked to on those platforms. So for instance, 
you know, Twitter is a really great tool for customer service, and and you can, um, you know, you have to really commit to being able to have quick responses on Twitter. And Facebook is a little bit more visual and a little bit more of a storytelling tool. And Instagram is completely visual, and you don't share links to articles; you just share, you know, beautiful and almost artistic um, images. And 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 Pinterest is where you can um, share recipes. It's really great for recipes and and more lifestyle um, elements that uh, people want to save and come back to. And so the more you know about things like how Twitter is a very quick thing and Instagram and Pinterest have a longer sh shelf life, um, the more that you can massage your personal messages in the, the most effective way that's going to really resonate and cause that engagement to happen. And um, so, so really and it goes back to just being real. Once you understand the best way to use these tools and, and who you're most likely to, to connect with on these tools and um, you know, just being a real person and acting the way you would act to customers in the store is how you want to respond to requests and questions and the way you want to have your voice and your tone um, be on each of those platforms. And uh, it's just a little bit of understanding the, the, um, the, the culture of each social media platform. Um, but, you know, one, one way that you can really drive engagement is by doing polls on these channels. And this is a per perfect way for, for co-ops that are just opening their doors to, to get um, their members to be part of the decision-making process. And it empowers them to make those kinds of cho choices for you. Um, and the social media tools are, are um, perfect for um, that technical capacity to, to open it up for polling. I'm going to have a circle back to that. I'm, one of the exciting announcements we are going to make today is I'm working with Michael and Holly right now to solidify a date. They have agreed to do an entire webinar for us on effectively utilizing social media throughout the startup process. So um, we're going to move into questions, and I know it feels like we just gave you a little taste on social media. They have so much more knowledge to share, and we, and we do have some questions here. I see about social media. We'll take those. Um, but I'm excited to say uh, you'll be looking soon for a date for an entire webinar on effective use of all the different social media platforms and all the things they can do. Um, as again, startups tend to do a very good job with this, but I often see there are many tools we're not using that are available uh, that Holly and Michael are going to be able to guide us through. So that's coming soon. Um, Great. Can you tell uh, who have... had the professional photo taken <laughs> of those two? <laughs> yeah, I don't have one of those either. Um, so we're going to move into the Q&A, and I've got a lot of great questions here, and I was, we just want to get through them as, if possible during the time we've got allowed. So um, one of the questions I'm going to start with Nicole is, how is, was, how is branding in Stage 3 different than marketing? If we have a social media and marketing plan, is that branding, or is branding a, a mindset that applies everywhere? Branding is more of your overall umbrella. It's so like branding is more of your identity. Your marketing plan is little ways to execute them. So if you have a social media plan, um, you can execute that. It can be part of a marketing plan as kind of like a little um, to-do or like addendum inside of it, but branding is honestly just a word for who you are. And marketing is um, a tool to get that across to people. Great. So your marketing plan is part of your branding. Your branding is your mm -hmm. full identity, which yes. is expressed partially through marketing. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Um, so what this one is actually, um, maybe Nicole and I will both take this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and uh, uh, talk about this one first. Ha can we have people or should we have people walk through uh, during construction to get them to feel connected to the project, um, to the brand we're developing? Uh, the answer is, First off, you need to have that relationship, uh, that discussion, actually, with, with your, um, your builder and your landlord. Uh, there are insurance issues that come into play. Some are very lenient, uh, some property owners and construction folks, um, but it is on their insurance rather than yours if construction has started, uh, especially for the, cons for the construction team. So they will want some input on how that's done and how it can be done safely. Certainly, um, hopefully you have great partners when it comes to your construction team and your building owner, and you can work with them on that. Although I'm betting, and I am gonna, I, I will ask Michael and Holly to address this in our webinar, there's a lot of ways that I've seen people do a great job through social media 
to giving people the experience of being there during the construction through social media. Uh, so we'll touch on that again. But can you? Yes, it's great. Maybe one or two limited times um, if you work with your partners to make sure it's safe and legal for everyone involved. So anything to add to that, Nicole? Yes, it's usually during working hours. Um, they have to be there and they have to be on the clock in order for their insurance to kind of kick in. Um, you have to wear a hard hat every single time, no matter if there's construction going on or not. And most of the time, they will have to stop what they're doing, which is fine. Um, but yeah, you can definitely, as part of the design team, because as a board member, you will be part of the design team, you can go in and take videos, you can go in and take photos. Um, I've had some stores interview, like the general contractor, um, and you can set all of this up ahead of time. They're very used to this. Everyone uses social media, and, and a lot of people do want to walk through the construction site. I've brought my kids on construction sites before, um, once in Illinois, and it was fun. You know, they, they got that, but there are certain points where you can and cannot do it. And the next question actually goes to social media, so I'll send this to Michael uh, and Holly. Uh, social media, uh, do we stand the risk of actually losing our brand, which has been a very intimate interaction up till now, by using products like Flipboard? Me? I, you, I, I will answer it. Okay. <laughs> no. No. Uh, here, and here's why. Unless you can come up with, okay, Unless you can come up with a lot of original content that uh, you own as a co-op, that you have uh, a steady stream of videos and blogs and visuals that you can constantly share out to feed this, you know, marketing machine for uh, your brand. No, there's no fear. There's, it's really a percentage. Holly, what's the percentage that we usually try to shoot for? I typically say do a 60-40 balance. 60-40. So try to get 60% of the content, be it original from mm -hmm. you content, and then 40% you can source from third parties. But I would even argue that it is still your brand because you, oh, choose, yeah. you choose what stories to post. So mm -hmm. if your co-op is really big into organic or non-GMO, or maybe it's more about the economy and mm -hmm. um, the the wealth wealth um, disparities. Whatever is your kind of issues as yeah. a co-op that you want your members to be aware of, you choose to share those kinds of stories, and that's what becomes right. your brand as well. Solar panels, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you can own it and you know share what's out there, and your audience will appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, and I think how you introduce it has a lot to do with it. You still have a voice in introducing the third-party information. So we'll go more into that in the social media one. Great question. Yep. Um, I'm going to take the one that's not social media because we don't have a ton of time left, and then we'll see how many of the social medias we can get to um, at the end. But we won't have Nicole next time. So let's uh, – Nicole, um, it sounds like there is a budget blur. Example, if lighting is part of – branding and is also part of the general build-out budget or the interior design budget, I'm confused. <laughs> it is incredibly confusing, um, even for the people who create the budgets. And lighting can fall in a couple different places. It can fall in interior design, um, and depending on the design firm, if you work with someone who is it's his own architect and you as the co-op have to go hire the contractors, that's different than like a design build firm who they have all of that and then they subcontract all of that through their own company. They oftentimes put it in their budget because they're working with the installer anyways. The installer can get good pricing on it. It's covered somewhere. Like I said, there's never going to be a part where it's just not covered. It's just the amount of money that um, you have set aside or even in your contingencies is it appropriate for what you're doing. And Lighting isn't in like the branding stage, but as almost all things visual, they all overlap and they all get thrown into the same pot. Mm -hmm. So lighting can help your brand. It's not in the branding budget. Um, it's interior design or it's architecture. Sometimes they'll split it up and put retail in the interior design and then backroom lighting in the architecture. It, it's all there. So, it's just a matter of breaking it down, and you don't have to worry about it. That's not your job. Um, you have to worry about providing the numbers to people so that we can figure out a more calculated budget as things go along. But right now, if you don't have that, I would not be surprised, um, and I would not expect you to have that broken down yet. 
So as you can hear, there's a lot of, of there is a lot of blur. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, you know, you're building this really delicate, detailed performa, and then when you hand it to your project manager or your GM, whoever's going to walk through a lot of this, um, a lot of blurring starts to happen. And that's why um, if we recommend, if at all humanly possible, that you have a project manager um, with some experience in this area or at least the time and energy to dedicate themselves fully to following up on these issues. But that budget blur, once you get to build out, is real. The money is all in there, but your, uh, your construction team, Nicole, uh, your project manager are going to be working to suss out uh, which money can afford to be put where to get what done. That's just the reality. And usually, okay, honestly, we've got when people waste, I will say that they... If you don't hash through some of this and you don't have a qualified team, I've seen people waste up to eight dollars a square foot just on redoing things. You know, that's a big deal. If you don't want to throw away money, you need to think about all of this upfront, and you need to have a project manager, whether it's volunteer or paid or whatever. I prefer paid experience, but someone needs to work through all of this with you, um, or you could possibly lose money. Yeah, it's, a, it's an important area, and actually it's something uh, we hope to cover soon in one of our webinars is talking about the project manager relationship and hiring project managers. So um, I think we've got time to maybe field one more of these social media questions. Um, <laughs> I'm going to start a little bit of the answer, and then I'm going to hand it off to Holly. Um, hey, we're designing a store right now, and you mean we need to start tweeting about it? How can we manage not to feel overwhelmed? Um, yes. That's a really, really, I understand the stage you're in. Um, you're already designing a store, trying to build a store. Uh, this is not your experience area. It is, it, and it's happening fast, and it feels really mm -hmm. stressful. Um, but carrying along your owners for the experience is really important. And actually, it's an easy place to use a volunteer. Um, and I'm going to hand it to Holly to give us a little bit of impression of maybe just some ideas on, on how to make it simple so you don't feel overwhelmed. Sure. So... First of all, you don't have to tweet, but it is a good idea if you want people to come to your store once it's open. Um, just like marketing, it is a way to announce to your communities that you are here. And it's also a really good way that people that are new to the community can find you if they're searching for you because social media is hugely tied to search engine results, and we can go into that at another time. But to... Um, you know, if you, if you've kind of gotten over the hump to think, okay, I do need this, and how do I how do I manage it? Well, there are um, tools that help manage social media um, management. Essentially, um, Hootsuite is a tool that you can schedule. Um, you can schedule all your posts at one time. You can get down to probably 15 minutes a day, and you can take 15 minutes of every day and say, these are the three to six tweets that we want to go out, one uh, po post on Facebook a week, and if you have a video or an article, you can slice and dice that up and use it over and over and over again. Because in the beginning, it's about brand awareness, and the, you, you have to say something 10 times before or most people hear at once. So it might feel like you have to come up with 10 new pieces of content every single day and how oh. overwhelming is that going to be? But um, really a video of a construction of, a, of an install um, that can be sliced and diced and used for probably a week if not two weeks straight. Great. Well, and if that sounds challenging and overwhelming, again, we've got a whole webinar coming up on it. Uh, also, uh, the other thing I want to point out is that you don't have to do everything yourself. There are some co-ops that are extremely confident uh, when it comes to social media, some that have a graphic designer on their team and so they do their own brand work, um, some who have within their team a, a, a banker who ends, up doing their, you know, who ends up doing a lot of their pro forma work with Bill Gessner at CDS. You'll have talents on your team where you're like, yeah, we can do this. Um, but also, that's what Holly and Michael exist for as well, is if it's starting to overwhelm you, this is a place you can bring in a professional to do a little bit of work to keep the brand going forward on social media while you focus on building the store. So with that, I'm going to wrap us up for the day. Um, we've had quite a, a lively conversation. I want to thank again Nicole Klimek of CDS Consulting. We can go back to her slide for just a second so folks can see her content, her contact. 
there she is. Uh, this is so. If you want to get in contact with Nicole, and remember, I can't stress enough um, how welcoming Nicole is. Any stage in your project, if you're not sure it's time to be in contact with Nicole, give her a quick call or email and find out what she thinks. Uh, share a little bit about the project uh, with her, so she can tell you uh, where she mm. can best jump in and be of help to you in your project. Any last parting words, Nicole? No, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic series. I've enjoyed it a lot. Um, and I think that we've opened up some doors and helped some people. So absolutely, give me a call. Um, you're not going to get a bill for it. Just ask me questions, anything. I'd rather have you um, know the path to go on than just walk blindly down the hallway and then call me later. So thank you very much, Jacqueline. Excellent. Thank you, Nicole. And such a good point. Your first consultation with anyone in this uh, industry is going to not be charged. And so call someone. Find out if you want to work together. Find out what they can share with you. Uh, find out if you've got the right click that they can do something for you that you want to move forward. But don't not make the call. Uh, that first call is not going to cost you. I know you guys are all on tight budgets. So uh, with that, we'll go to some of our, our closing slides here. And go forward a couple. All right. So real quickly, before we close up, I'm going to reintroduce uh, Mary Stems Wilborn, our outreach coordinator, who is going to uh, share about an exciting change coming up for the Food Co-op Initiative that we'd like to talk about for just a second with you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Food, fall 2015 is nearly upon us. With the change in seasons, Food Co-op Initiative is changing as well. We are saying goodbye to our old logo and embracing and celebrating the new one. The board and staff of Food Co-op Initiative is excited about our new dynamic logo design. The three circles represent the three stages required in food co-op development. Stage one, organizing. Stage two, feasibility and planning stage, and stage three, implementation. We guide startups through the three stages. Food co-op initiative, new co-ops start here. Thank you. All right. So wrapping up, um, that's our webinar for this month. You can find these as well as all the handouts that go along with the content that Nicole shared with you on our events page on our website at www.foodcoopinitiative.coop.coop. Please go there. You can find the slides from this, uh, handouts that go along with the, the material, as well as links to the videos to all of our webinars that you can share with others that you're working and organizing with at your co-op. Our next webinar is going to be Tuesday, September 21st at 1 p.m. Central Time. And we will have announcements, actually, of our next three uh, webinars coming up very soon. Watch our website, watch our social media, especially our Facebook page, uh, and also watch your email box. We'll be sending out information about that soon. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a good day. <laughs>